Well, thanks so much for joining me today for episode seven of season four of the Healthy Skeptic MD podcast. I'm Dr. Michael Hockman. I'm happy to be joined today by Dr. Drew Pinsky, better known to many of us simply as Dr. Drew, the longtime radio talk show host of Loveline, also a frequent media guest and a producer for medical TV shows and series. Now, what's less well known about Dr. Drew is that in addition to his media work, he is actually a very well-respected internist and addiction medicine spe specialist with over, over 30 years experience caring for patients. And we're very happy to have him today join me to talk about uh, not only the COVID-19 pandemic, but also how do we treat the mental health and substance use needs of those experiencing homelessness. If you do find today's episode engaging, please do search and subscribe to the Healthy Skeptic MD wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Search for Healthy Skeptic MD on YouTube to find my YouTube channel. Also, leave a review if you have a chance and do pass this along to friends, family, and others who might be interested. So before we jump into our interview with Dr. Drew today, let's start with a rundown of the news of the week. And the first topic, of course, is the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, we are yet again in the midst of another surge. Many of us hoped we were at the tail end and we're not quite at the end of this pandemic quite yet. There have been a lot of alarming news headlines, particularly amongst kids. And rather than trying to delve into that, I've decided to devote next episode in two weeks to COVID-19 in children. I, my guest will be Dr. Jessica Hockman, a pediatrician and my wife, who's been on the show a couple times before. And uh, it, I think it's going to be a really good discussion because Jessica takes the pandemic very, very seriously, but she's done a very nice job of keeping her patients and the community where she works calm during the pandemic. So look forward to that episode coming up in two weeks. So secondly, I wanted to cover two diabetes items that were in the news this week. So the first is unfortunately bad news, a new article in, in JAMA that found that the proportion of U.S. adults who have diabetes increased from 9.8% to 14.3%. That was between 1999 and 2018. So yet another sign that our couch potato lifestyles are not that good for our health. Um, but also this week, a new federal uh, guideline came out about screening for diabetes, and it recommended screening those between the ages of 35 and 70 years old who are overweight. And the prior guidelines had recommended starting at 40. So in theory, it makes a lot of sense to try to identify and manage diabetes as early as possible. But I do have concerns about the new guidelines. And the reason for that is what to do with the results. So frequently when we screen for diabetes, we will catch people with prediabetes or early stage diabetes. And too often the reaction in our medical system is to throw medications at the problem, get the patient on medications. But of course, the treatment of diabetes and prediabetes in many cases is lifestyle changes and medications are simply a band-aid. And I worry that this is going to trigger too much overuse of medications too quickly. So we just have to be careful how we use the data that we get from this increased screening that's going to be happening. That's it for the news summary this week. Let's jump into our interview with Dr. Drew. Well, I, we have a very special guest today. Very happy to be joined by Dr. Drew. Such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So, Dr. Drew, we, we were going to talk about uh, some of the topics you're most known for, and particularly homelessness and a little bit about the COVID pandemic. But um, I can't help but asking, first off, you, you're a doctor like me. You went to medical school at University of Southern California, and then you took an interesting detour in your career, and you became a, a media doctor. And just out of curiosity, how did you go in that direction? There have been multiple bizarre detours in my career. Um, not the least of which into the psychiatric setting. So, so I got to kind of tell you the whole story here. And it's not, any, it's not a simple one, as always. And I will just frame it by saying, there is, I've never had a blueprint. I never kind of understood where I was going. I, it's always been sort of an improvisation and an experimentation and trying to, you know, as things present themselves to me, I walk through the door because it's interesting and try to make something good or purposeful out of it. But um, I was, uh, two things were happening uh, late in medical school and during residency. One was uh, we were deep into the AIDS epidemic at the time. Uh, and, I, you know, as a third and fourth year medical student, I was telling people they had six months to live every day. And this, this was, a, you know, I, I don't know if your training coincided as much with the dark days of of HIV and AIDS. We caught but the we end didn't have of it, a, so probably yeah, not, we didn't the, have a cause of, not the yeah, pre-treatment days. I, yeah, I was there when the AZT, you know, packages arrived at County Hospital. We were opening the boxes. I go, oh my God, here we go. We have something to offer. And uh, in, just an interesting sidebar, 
and the Dallas Buyers Clubs were undermining everything we were trying to do. While they were useful and we had nothing to do, when we had something to do, they became a problem. But an, another story for another day. Uh, but I, I was, you know, deep in it. I, I felt, I mean, it's, it was such a dark chapter and very few people around to tell the tale. The patients are all gone. The, the physicians, uh, you know, are my age or have moved on or retired. And that was a pandemic where the fatality rate was 100% in all cases. I, again, as a late medical student, I was telling people they had six months to live when I sat down with them. I was never wrong. And at the time, one Anthony, Anthony Fauci was uh, a guiding light for me, and he was strongly advocating us to get out there, young physicians, and educate about this. Um, I realized that particularly no one was talking to young people about it. And all of a sudden, this opportunity to go on the radio came along. It was just an accident. I, I lived down the street from our radio station. And they had a show in the middle of the night that they had to turn into a community service thing. And somebody said, hey, Pinsky's in medical school. Maybe you can help give some useful information out. And uh, I went up there with my textbooks, freaked out, like, oh, my God, what am I getting myself into? But was blown away by the fact that young people at the time, you have to remember the power of radio at the time and what a cultural influence it was on young people. They were coming with their most important issues and questions, and they never, no one had ever talked to them about HIV and AIDS. I thought, oh my God, I got to keep, I got to come back. I got to keep doing this. And so one night a week, late in the night, like 11 to 1, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m., if I wasn't on call or I didn't have an early morning, I would go in there on Sunday nights for 10 years. I, I thought I was doing community service, really. It was interesting. It was fun. I met interesting people. And uh, as the pandemic progressed, there was lots for me to talk about. And you got to remember the term safe sex hadn't been even coined yet and condoms were behind the counter. You had to ask the pharmacist to retrieve them for you. I mean, it was just so many barriers to good health behaviors and, and a weird collective, you know, we'd been through this bizarre seventies uh, period where, um, you know, sexuality was just to be unrestrained in all situations, but no one ever contemplated that adolescents might follow suit. I mean, like it wasn't even a thought. And I was 24 years old at the time going, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's, it's, it's somebody's got to talk to them. And all you had was people like Dr. Ruth going, oh, no, more, more, have, have at it. I'm like, wait, well, there are biological consequences here that you need to understand. So that was all my motivation at the beginning. At the end of my internship, um, somebody said, hey, anybody want to work at the psychiatric hospital down the street? And I, and I was like, well, I'll been resident in two weeks I'm, i'll go check it out you know and uh became fascinated by the medical care of psychiatric patients and and so i moonlighted there throughout my residency but i my residency concluded i got more involved there and actually took over their department of medicine and became really skilled in the medical care of psychiatric patients which is a much more important issue than you might imagine that many people imagine uh, i'd say at least 30 percent of the time a, psych, a medical issue was causing or contributing to the psychiatric syndrome or caused by the psychotropic medications. I mean, there was stuff to do all the time. But of course, nowhere more was there more to do than on the drug unit. So I was down there all the time and got very skilled at drug withdrawal, which was not a discipline I was medical students or residents were trained in, in spite of treating alcoholics and heroin addicts hand over fist, no one ever said there's a systematic way you can get these people off drugs. I got very good at that. So people are asking me to see more addicts. And finally, after I finished residency, the, uh, the, you know, I was, I was well into this probably in, in the late eighties, early nineties, the director of the program said, Hey, could you be the assistant director? And it's no big deal. I, you know, I'm gone. You're there all the time anyway. I'll back you up. Now, I, I go on vacation at Christmas. I need you to step in then. And uh, six, nine months later, he quit. <laughs> and they put me into the position of director. And, and that's where I started really taking this seriously. Got another board certification in addiction medicine. And uh, took me several years to really get to the level of expertise where I was satisfied. But addiction medicine has been this great journey where you really sit at the crossroads of, of so many disciplines, neurology, neuroscience, psychiatry, family systems, psychology, uh, medical issues. I mean, it just all is right there. And so I, I, I spent then another 25 years doing that. So, And then whatever happened to media after radio was just sort of me going, oh, what's a TV show? I don't know. How do you do that? Show, show me where to go. And okay, yeah, let's try it. 
And I'm still doing that to this day. <laughs> well, one of my ulterior motives of having you today is we are trying to take on something similar to that uh, in partnership with SCAN, with our new medical group, Healthcare in Action for Patients Experiencing Homelessness. Many of these patients have a primary uh, condition that's not actually a physical me medical problem, but a mental condition or substance use. And yet we are going to try and take on their overall uh, health. And I, and I really just think that that model of having a, a primary care doctor who oversees the mental health yep. and the physical health yep. is, is really important for these yep. challenging populations. Yep. And, and, and to be fair, I was, I was one of the only, and one of the reasons I clung to that job for so many years is uh, to, for an internist to be in that position, particularly at that time was unheard of. It, it's only psychiatrists that did that. And, and I just thought it was such a privilege to be in that position for the, very much for the reasons you're pointing out, that having that general medical knowledge is a benefit for these patients. The other reflection I had on what you said is having gone through the, the HIV pandemic, I, I've I've got the sense that those who have, who lived through it, who were doctors during it, and I don't include myself in that because I really caught the tail end, have a have a better perspective on the COVID pandemic, not in any way to downplay the, the significance of it, but 100% mortality is very different from what we're dealing with with this virus. Absolutely. In fact, I'm, I had a little medical issue and I was talking to the attending on that. He was my age and, and we both were sharing this exact point where he was like, man, the younger guys are really upset about this, but I, we were in AIDS. I mean, this is, it was hard. It's, it's much, much very different. And then I was raised by a, my dad who's a family practitioner and he, he is in my head all the time. I mean, he's gone many years now, but I literally, I can hear him going, wait a minute, they shut the world down because of respiratory, what, a what? Wait, we had yellow fever, polio, we had we had tuberculosis. You shut the world down because of a respiratory virus? He would have been, he would have died again. There's no doubt in my mind about it. And so that's been in my head playing also. Well, I, we've really respected throughout this pandemic, um, you know, that you have been willing to, to give an alternative perspective and, you know, people make their own decisions, but it's important to hear uh, all viewpoints and I really re respected that you've been able to, in an evidence-based way, lay out, uh, you know, not, not a contradictory perspective, but just a different one. No, I've been trying to emphasize data and positions that reduce the mental health consequences. I, I, from the beginning, from day one, I, I could see the hysteria, the panic. I could see it having profound effects. I could see the unintended consequences coming and they came. I was not wrong. Now, I was, um, I was not, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, um, sort of uh, circumspect enough when I when I was pushing back. I, I should have been more, that was my mistake. I was pushing back hard because I could see, I was at the time I was fighting a, a tidal wave of press. I mean, do you remember the word staggering? I mean, every, this, everything was staggering. We have more cases now than when staggering cases was on the lips of every reporter. We have more now. I've not heard the word staggering in six months. And I could, I could just tell what they were doing. And it was all so they could get eyes. They did not give a damn about the consequences of what they were doing. They, had, they wouldn't even understand it. Then another thing happened that bothered me, which is we all froze in place in primary care. We became scared of the social media. We became scared of the tidal wave of, you know, of the mob and the, and the media. And we just became froze. We stopped doing what we normally do. And we handed over the responsibility to organizations that I don't know about you, have never been involved directly in the care of patients in my career. It's not as though the FDA, the NIH, the NIMH, the CDC was involved in my decision making for a patient. They gave me information, they supported stuff, I would read their things, good, but when it came time to make a decision, that wasn't my training, my judgment. And we just froze and ceded it to bureaucracies. That was a mistake. Yeah, I was gonna say, I have a lot of respect for public health officials. But the guidelines that are put out, it's very different when you're one on one with a patient and you're trying to interpret it. It's not it their job. So many consequences. Yeah. 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 That's not the job that they, they first of all, many of them are not clinicians or they have not been clinician in a long time. They uh, are not set up for a risk reward analysis for a given clinical situation. And they don't admit when they're wrong and change direction. I mean, what's the thing we're trying to do? It's like, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I, 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 we didn't intend this, but we're going to do this now. I mean, that, that come, you know, it, all the literature says just come up front, be honest, be direct. 
not the bureaucracies. It's the opposite. And so I, I've been very concerned about that. And that just continued and continued and then got picked up by the social media network. I mean, just everything is supporting this weird secession of of our, what we normally do. And it's just been gravely, gravely concerning to me. Yeah, I was actually just yesterday in a conversation with an older patient. She was about 80. She had had COVID herself and fortunately done very well with it. And she was really struggling with the decision whether or not to get the vaccine. And the guidelines are all make you feel terrible if you don't. And she was feeling right. that pressure. On the other hand, That's she felt right. that she probably had immunity. And, and I couldn't argue with her on, on that point. Right. That, that, and and the, here's the thing that's troubling me right now, and this, you'll feel this as well, and it's what you're talking about, in fact, here, is that the data is not clear. It's, it's, a, somebody, it's, it doesn't, it's not fully represented. It's a little obscured. And so it's hard to do genuine informed consent right now. I think I know how to do it. And I believe when the day is done, I will be right to tell the patient to get vaccinated, but it's it's not the usual situation. It's all very confusing. And so can you imagine for the patients? And so every patient I talk to discuss, you know, that's resistant talks about trust. I don't know who to trust. I don't know who to trust. And um, I just try to build the trust. I try because that's what we should be doing, not telling them they're bad. They have, they're going to go to jail if they don't get vaccinated, all this crazy stuff. It should be about building trust and helping them understand what's out there, helping them understand our perspective when we recommend the vaccine. Well, let me ask you this, Dr. Drew. Um, what would you say the the our country medical professionals have done well during this pandemic? And what would you say, where have we fallen short? Well, we've done well. This was the other thing that was in my head when I was pushing back. And people kept going, but look at Italy, look at Italy. I, we're not Italy. We are not Italy. We will show you what we can do. I, at the very beginning, I was saying, you, you, our data, the data that everyone points at about how many problems and holes there are in our healthcare system. This is what we do best. We can, we can flex and improvise and we will respond. We will come up with therapeutics and we will come up. I guaranteed, I knew it. I knew our peers. I knew, I knew the scientific community. I knew how this would work. There was never a doubt in my mind that we would have, we would be able to handle, we would just do it. It's the way we always have done it. And I, I expected more guidance from the CDC and Dr. Fauci and less mandates, but they got caught up in everything themselves too. But we, we did, I mean, we killed ourselves. We put ourselves at risk. We, we t accepted every, every responsibility and every circumstance on behalf of the patients at hand. The thing we did poorly is something I've never seen us do before ever, which is, oh, you have an, a, a illness, go home until it gets worse. Then I'll talk to you. That's a, that is, mind-boggling to me. That was the first time I'd seen physicians well, I think we overemphasized complications of the disease and underappreciated the mental and psychological impacts of, of some of those and mandates. did not make any efforts at early treatment or f careful follow-up or staying on top of. It was sort of, you're either going to get better or you're going to get worse. And and that is, I've never approached an illness like, like I mean, I, if, if, if I believe that in an illness, I would be on top of that patient every day to, to, to really adjust course. And, you know, early on, things like steroids were being discussed. All kinds of things were being discussed. And we just, just nothing, zero, wouldn't contemplate anything. Uh, personally, I had COVID, you know, in December. And uh, steroids and monoclonal antibodies kept me out of the hospital. I had a bad, I was a moderate to severe COVID. And I was sick for almost three months. And... Thank God, my physician, with my input, we were, you know, I kept saying, we got to do something. And, but the average payout, what has it? And I am, by the way, I did it all through telemedicine. We, so we should have been teaching patients how to do telemedicine, how to do it cost effectively, what kinds of treatments are available to discuss with your physician. We didn't, th that should have been the public health chant. If, if, if keeping people out of the hospital was the goal, why didn't we do that? It was so confusing to me. Patients were confused and scared and didn't know what to do. And there were lots of them. And um, we, we, had, we had armies of people ready to do telemedicine that, that could have at least kept an eye on some of this stuff that turned bad. 
when people weren't looking. Well, I, I do agree with you, and I think in, in retrospect, it's proven to be the case. Although we are not, of course, completely done with the pandemic, but um, but you know, I have a hard time. Uh, I always feel bad criticizing public health officials because I do think they had a hard job. But I that doesn't mean I don't agree with your your perspective. Like I think I th I think the two two things. Yeah, you know, we're just you know what they do well, what they do wrong. I mean, I, I think Dr. Fauci, when the day is because I've been through fa five pandemics with Dr. Fauci, and he's always been an ex exceptional HIV H. H1N1. I had H1N1 also. I, I get everything. SARS-1, SARS-2, MERS-1, or just MERS, uh, HIV, and now uh, SARS-2. And he has been just exceptional on every step of the way, just exceptional. So I am guessing it's the political horror we've all been through that he got him. He faced politics right, this right. time, unlike anything he's faced. That's right. Yeah. But I think we, there will be a, remer, a reversion to the mean with his uh, performance before we're done, and he will be fine by the time we're done. I stand behind him very, very firmly. And, and the other thing I think it's almost a cliche at this point to say, but I still don't think it's said enough, that we have to give ourselves credit for getting a vaccine approved. It's really that's part. That's part of that, that. I said that, yes, that's part of what I knew. I knew it. I just knew we would come up with stuff. I just I, just, I see how we work. No, uh, no system or organization on earth does that the way we do it and we do it selflessly we we've always done it and we just do it but but i i wanted to go back to a couple of um sort of not harsh but just sort of things wondering why public health did what they did during the hiv epidemic we you know we had a massive problem of trying to change health behavior powerful health behavior sexual behaviors and the, a discipline emerged across the 10 years of, of the heat of that pandemic that was a comprehensive, um, evidence-based, effective way to change health behavior. And here's what we discovered. We discovered that if you create a narrative about a relatable source, meaning age or sex or, or ethnicity of the, of the people you wanna change the behavior, a narrative about a relatable source where the consequences of that person, that narrative, are shown in a some sort of presentation, and you throw in some cultural elements, some music, and throw in some humor, that changes behavior dramatically, dramatically. While you or I in a box does not do very much. It doesn't do very much at all in terms of, it increases, we can change their knowledge base, we can't change their behavior. And that, that discipline that was evolved around HIV and AIDS was just dis just dismissed during this. I couldn't believe it. I was shocked that they didn't in any way call back on what we know to be the case. And then mandates and in, in, from on high stuff, people there, there's always a certain population that will just resist like hell that kind of thing. And the shaming, I think, unfortunately, backfires in many cases. So not always. only did they not do not what you're cases. describing, yeah. but it it's. The, Look, yeah. I, I tried to, I'm trying to get drug addicts to stop doing drugs. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm involved in this phenomenon in a deep way, changing behavior when people don't want to change. And if you go straight at them, if you go at them with aggression or shaming or anything, four shields up, they're way worse when you do that. They aren't going to get near you as opposed to rapport and, and judgment and consequence. And, you know, what do they do in meetings? In meetings, you go to meetings, 12 step meetings, people stand up and tell their stories. And those stories and the consequences is what causes the behavioral change in the patient sitting listening to that. Well, I think we learned that effectively for HIV and other pandemics, we're not doing abstinence only. We're doing safe needle exchanges. We haven't made perfect be the enemy of the good. And, you know, I've, I think we've been trying to do that too much with this with this pandemic. Yeah, yeah. it's been shocking. We could talk about COVID forever, uh, but I really want to make sure we ha get to homelessness. Um, and before I do, one more warm-up question. You, despite uh, all the media you do, TV shows, radio, podcast, you still make time to see patients. Uh, can I you do. tell us a little bit about patients. your practice? Um, you know, I, I have slowly honed down over the last 10 years. So I, I used to, for, I'm a, well, I think I'm a recovering, at least mostly recovering workaholic. And, and uh, I was really bad. I was getting up at five in the morning. I was doing hospital rounds in the ICU by 6.30. I would have dozens of patients in the hospital and then see dozens of patients in the outpatient setting, strictly medical, and then do the addiction medicine, the psychiatric piece, starting around 3 p.m. And that would go till 10 p.m. 
that was every day except the weekends where I did nursing. That was the, except the weekends where I did nursing home rounds for eight hours. So it was uh, craziness. And so I've honed all that down carefully. So now all I'm doing is, is following my general medical patients as outpatients who I've seen for years and years and years and doing sort of, um, you know, CNL consultation liaison on addiction. I'm not, I'm not actually taking the cases, but I'm assessing and helping and referring and that kind of stuff. So you've written and spoken a lot uh, in the last couple of years about the issue of homelessness, which is perhaps the biggest social challenge our country's facing. First off, how did you become interested in this topic? Well, um, all my patients, when they use long enough, become homeless, particularly when they use meth and opiates. Um, so homelessness is a part of the natural history of addiction. And uh, IV drugs and smoked meth will drive you there very, very, very quickly. So I am very familiar with the population that ends up on the street. When the population started expanding, I became almost agitated. Because I, I, it's like, I, this, imagine you're a surgeon and you're seeing the thing you can crick surgically just start to proliferate in the population and no one's doing anything about it and you could fix it. It's you. It's hard to sleep at night, and not only are you not allowed to sleep to to fix it. Legislatures put in a ton of things that make it impossible for you to help, and more likely for the people you've been watching to get sick and die. So there was nothing for me to do but get concerned, and uh, I started um, because these are my patients. I mean, just in LA County alone, they're dying at the rate of five a day, and every year we go up by one increased patient per day deaths. Uh, we've lost more people to drug addiction in San Francisco than COVID by a good number. And so the fact that this is not addressed is astonishing to me. But, and, and this is, these are, let's make no mistake about it. These are drug addicts. I, I was just on a skid row a couple weeks ago and, I, and I, it's really now, I just walked around that with another uh, a nurse friend of mine who's a recovering guy. And we were just like, everybody here is a drug addict. This is all drug addiction. It's all carefully obscured. He was showing me how they were trafficking and who was trafficking and who was you. I, I couldn't see it as a non-addict, but he could see it all. And he was showing me. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah I get it. I see it. Uh, and uh, I, I just thought it's it's now become that. Uh, and I don't care how they got that way. We're there. I, I don't I don't care. I don't care if it's because of homelessness that they're strung out. I, I don't care. We're there. We have th th We're there. We're it's either serious mental illness or addiction on the streets with a, a population that, that scrolls through the average duration on the street is about three months. I'm concerned with the chronically homeless. The chronically homeless is what I'm worried about because those are the people that are going to die because in the disease of addiction, which is a, this is the part that everybody misses, it is a progressive illness. I cannot underline that enough. If you leave it be, it will progress to demise. That's the nature of the illness. And so we're just letting people die. And I, uh, it just, I can't, all the words almost don't come out of my mouth, especially when I know so much can be done for them. So I think what the way you describe it is very compelling, but there has actually been pushback to that perspective about what the root cause is here. And you know, some people say the root cause is simply an affordability, affordable housing I, I don't care. I, I don't care. I, I, they are not diagnosticians. They've not worked in a psychiatric hospital for three years. I don't care what got people to the state I'm seeing. I see it. I diagnostically, yeah. I see it. I know what it is. I don't care how they got there. They now have an illness that requires a treatment. I don't care what the, the root cause is. Yeah. That's a, a medical illness that I know well, and it will kill people. If you do, it will not, it will not. It's just like if somebody's uh, addiction is caused by trauma, which it frequently is. Treating the trauma does nothing for the addiction. In fact, often makes it worse. You have to treat the addiction. It's a separate illness. You don't treat it, it's progressing. Right. And uh, so you were recently nominated. I hate to bring politics in, but I, but I do think this one's an important topic to bring up. You were recently nominated by L.A. County Board of Supervisor Catherine Barger to serve on a homelessness commission here locally. And I was really surprised that there was some opposition because of some the opposition. perspective you just uh, Wild made. Wild opposition. And, Wild and it, it didn't end up didn't end up going through. Could you just tell us a little bit about that experience? So I I, I didn't want the job. Uh, Catherine Barker sort of begged me to do it, and and I thought, what well, you know, 
I'm going to be so frustrated seeing how they're doing this, but if she really wanted me to, I, and I thought, all right, I have an obligation to learn how this stuff is being allocated and really where the money's been going. And I said, okay. And I did some, and I told everybody I'm going in with an open heart and an open mind. I'm going to keep my mouth shut and learn as much as I can. Oh my God, there was a reaction where you would thought I said I was going to come in with an automatic weapon and kill the people on the, on the, literally, that was the kind of reaction on the committee. And I want to remind everybody, there is not one single medical doctor on this committee which is allocating resources for medical illnesses that are killing five people a day. I mean, think about that. If we were running a wing of a hospital where five people were dying a day and there were no doctors running that wing, I, I, it's, it's breathtaking to me. It's breathtaking. And let me just say, you, you, if you know the history of how we got here, we did this. <laughs> well, it was really a psychiatrist that did it. But there, there's, a, there's a history you can learn that, that is so clear about how we got to where we are. And let me underline as, with as bright a line as I possibly can, I am not interested in criminalizing sick people. That is the last thing I want to do. I want to get everyone in treatment and get them well. I, I know how people can flourish with addiction, even people who seem helpless. I've got tons of peers that I associate with on a daily basis to go help people like that. And we do it all the time. It's not as though it's a hope. It, it can be hopeless, and there. But even for the hopeless cases, there's stuff we can do. As you mentioned, the harm avoidance strategies can keep people from dying. And so that is a, a deficiency that there's no physician voice on this commission. How is that translated into into improper decisions? And how would you do it differently if you did have that opportunity to serve? They, well, I, like I said, I would keep my. I, don't, I can't know yet because I've never been in a committee meeting. But, but I, so I, like I said, I would have kept my mouth quite tightly shut until I really understood what was going on there. But I, I would say you have to have a, there's never been a diagnostic assessment of the people on the streets. It, there's, there's, you know, high school age kids with questionnaires. Do you have mental illness? Oh, have you, do you know anybody with serious mental illness that will tell you they have mental illness? <laughs> I mean, it, that's this, they all have anisognosia. And so we have privileged anisognosia in all of the conduct we we have towards the population, where we the people that don't understand how serious mental illness works, we have we have taken the phenomenon of anisognosia, except in the setting of dementia. Interestingly, if you don't rush in on demented patients with their brain disease, you're guilty of elder abuse. But if the same symptom complex is caused by a serious mental illness, you can't get near them astonishing. Well, that's that's our thesis with our new medical group, Healthcare in Action, that health needs are in, inextricably intertwined with uh, being homeless, that you can't get somebody out of homelessness without addressing their health needs. You also have to think about the housing issues too, but it, they need to be done side by of side. Course. And of course, but let my patients, let me just tell you, my patients, you put them in more secure environments, they're going to use more and they're going to die more. So you have to prepare for that. You have to do something about that. I, yes, housing, absolutely. Housing is. And that's one of the there. concerns is that you take somebody who's got active substance use and schizophrenia or bipolar and you put them in a single residence occupancy where they don't have their community around them and it's just a recipe for, for failure. For demise. And that's not a failure of the person. That's a failure of the system. For demise. For, for We're talking about people dying here. This is, oh, Jesus. And and. And it's, I don't know, it's so frustrating because it's an illness and a, these are illnesses I know so well. And to see people stigmatizing them by denying them and to stigmatizing them by minimizing, it's just so stigmatizing what they're doing here. But, okay, I get excited because it's breathtaking to me. And and that's and that's something that I've appreciated about the advocates. There, no one should be stigmatized for having a substance use disorder, which in my view and in the medical community's view, is like any other medical illness, like hypertension or diabetes. They're dying of a substance use or a mental illness, and we should treat it as such. And there's nothing to be ashamed about there. And there's nothing controversial in my mind. Nothing controversial is the key. I, I think changing the nomenclature was a mistake. As soon as you start, as soon as you start going, oh, we can't, we can't call them this, we can't call them that. Trust me, my patients love calling themselves what they are. Rigorous honesty is their is their is their rallying cry, and they have to have that. And they, it's it's uh, you, you can't go into a meeting and find people calling themselves substance use disorder patients. They call themselves drug addicts, and that's stig they feel it's stigmatizing to try to you know you're you're putting that's putting labels on people. You know they all know what they are. They all know what they've had, and they and they they're they're 
they don't feel stigmatized by that. The, I tell you where I feel compl hear complaints about stigmatization is from families. Families feel marginalized and stigmatized, and, and they kind of drove some of the some of this. But I, I, unfortunately, I, I don't think it helps the patients. There's never been I've never I've treated somewhere between five and seven thousand drug addicts in my day, and no one ever came in and said the reason I can't get well is I'm feeling stigmatized. <laughs> I mean, never nothing. Nothing, not even close. So like I said, I had an ulterior motive in having you on today. Um, you've got a lot of experience treating people with substance use disorders and mental health and homelessness. And I'd love a free consultation. Uh, you know, what should right. our healthcare in action medical group do? We're going to have physician okay. assistants. We're going to have mental health providers, social workers, yeah. peer navigators. Uh, we're going to be using a street medicine approach, meaning we're not even going to have bricks and mortar clinic. We're going to be out in a mobile van. Well, do you have any high level guidance for us? Make sure you have recovering people on the squad because you have to realize that when people are in the disease of addiction, their brain does not function the way yours and mine does. And we can easily miss where the disease is operating while a recovering person never misses it. So I, I can't, I, I kept myself surrounded by recovering staff all the time because I would get enthusiastic about I, what I was doing and the staff would just go, Psst. They just want to get high. Stop it. It's, 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 yeah. You're, no. you, you think you're, yeah. Mm -mm. They just saw a big RX over your head and they're, they're manipulating you. So relax. And I would go, God, you're right. Every time, every time you, you have to, you have to be, um, you have to have a deep understanding of how this thing works in an interpersonal context. The disease of addiction, you know, I always tell my patients that the uh, Audrey two in the little shop of horrors, you know, the plant that eats everybody is a perfect model for particularly alcoholism, but addiction generally, which is if you go near the plant, you go in the plant, you can, it, it eats you, it takes, it, it takes advantage of everything good in the environment and interpersonal relationships are no exception. So everything you have in terms of your judgment and your well-meaning intent will get distorted in the context of trying to treat a patient with addiction. And if you don't have a lot of experience with it and see it when it operates or feel it when it's operating, you have to have somebody else there with you going, ah, ah, just kicking you in the, in the back and the shoulder a little bit. Ah, ah, mm, 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 mm. Nope, you're going in, you're going in the plant. And uh, just like in the little shop of horrors, you had to have somebody pulling you back out of the plant or you, you went all the way in. Well, I'm happy to say that our first hire was uh, who's going to lead a team of peer navigators is someone who himself has experienced homelessness, has had substance use orders uh, himself, Great. Great. and you know that's. Well, I have another. I have another philosophy. piece of advice for. I have another, having run large units. You know, I was director of a of a big inpatient and a freestanding psychiatric hospital unit where our reputation was to be. We could handle any patient, no matter how many diagnoses, as long as they didn't need a ventilator. Or, or a cardiac monitor. Otherwise, we got them. They could be seasoned, they could be psychotic, they could be infected, they, anything. We, we could handle it. And we had really good outcomes. But I had one requirement. Uh, over the years, I saw some trouble emerge when people with addiction, particularly if you had less than five years of sobriety, but not exclusively that population, people with, in recovery who start to work with addicts must go to Al-Anon. Either have a therapist or go to Al-Anon. You must. It's highly triggering to the people with this disease, and, and you can slip. You can slip into it. You won't get taken advantage of the way I will. You won't get manipulated because you, you see it. it. It will trigger some of the code, some of the deeper stuff in your own stuff and move you away from your recovery, essentially. So you've got to do some codependency work uh, while you are treating patients because it can be very problematic otherwise. And final advice question, it, you know, is have you interfaced with the housing services sector in this or is your view get the mental, the the health conditions under control first? I, I have, I, I don't know what you mean by interacted. I'm, I'm aware of all the different housing uh, efforts being made and I, I applaud nearly all of them. I, I have no, I have no problem with, I, I mean, well, some of it is sort of, I, the, on, the only problem I have with it is it's not, being done with an understanding of the population they're serving. Like Santa Monica built a large facility with, with no windows. You people with serious mental illness in a, in a room with no windows, they, they're not going to stay in that room. It's not going to happen. And, uh, I, and, and again, the way that things are being organized, don't understand how people that some substance use disorders operate. And so it's going to, it's going to be a mess unless they plan for that. But the actuality of the housing, I, I support hundred percent. I'm very concerned about NIMBYism. 
I would love to see us build some large residential facilities. I'm, I'm you know, I hear that there's some movement towards maybe this. I'm, I can't talk about this, but there's a large building downtown where apparently some really good resources are starting to move in that direction when people know how to run residential programs, how to staff residential programs, how to create work and vocational rehab and, you know, a life for people in these environments that they can live in for a year or two and then transition out into the into the world. Treatment works. This is the thing that people have got to understand. Treatment works, but you have to provide the, the necessary elements and resources. And numero uno is medical. And if you don't do that, you don't even get off the ground. Well, I agree with you. There are some really good housing services providers. I actually recently had John Masseri, who's the CEO of The People Concern, on this uh, podcast, the Downtown Women's Center, and there's several others. And, you know, we're trying to, to match really, with really good ones and, um, you know, be ready to strike when the iron is hot, when the mental health conditions are in a place where the patient will succeed to have those uh, connections to housing service providers ready ready to go. Oh, or, or, or simultaneously. I think it's great as long as, long as you're, you're there. And, but, but it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the idea that you could swing by twice a week and do a sort of mental health checks, that is not what I'm talking about. I am talking about you have to have real treatment. These are people who are at the end stage of these illnesses. It literally is like you're dealing with a hematologic problem and, and we're gonna we're just gonna give you some Tylenol now as opposed to some real treatment. It doesn't make sense. You've got to be prepared for the for the range of services that are necessary for each given patient. And some you know, they may not, well, a lot will not participate. And that's going to be a whole other challenge that we we got to have teams ready to help motivate. And that's the recovering community can really help with that too. Yeah. Well, I think you're exactly right about the, the need for intensive daily treatment. And we also want to be available 24 seven. So if there is a crisis, we can respond. You know, Not everyone's going to let us know, but when someone does that, we're ready to respond right away. Right. So, doc, Dr. Drew, I wanted to end on a positive note uh, with with homelessness. This is, this is all positive. You look what you guys are doing. This is positive. This is movement. And this is I like it. In, this is yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's 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 unfortunately it's everyone having to do things individually. It's not a large collective, but you're 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 aligning with the housing people. The housing people want your services. This is good. This is a good thing. I think there's a lot of really good people. And, and it's things. driven by medical people, and that, that's the part that I'm I'm so happy to see because <laughs> anyway, you know I feel well, the, the part I, that I'm gets really, me pessimistic yeah. on some days is that despite all these efforts, the the numbers of people living on the streets is rising. We see it anecdotally with more people under those bridges, and we see the the numbers rising every year. Why sh why should we be optimistic? Why how and why are we going to get this under control? This crisis over the next several years. Well, it's organizations like yours, of course, that are going to really uh, make a difference and you're going to be able to show your outcomes and then people will start to catch on, hopefully. But we've got to change some laws. We, we, you know, I, I have patients that contact me from all over the country. And the first thing they tell me as they start to head towards the street is, I'm going to California. They all, they all say the same thing. I hear there's lots of services. I can use drugs and not be hassled by the police. And I can sell and I can steal to support my habit. They come to California from everywhere because of these laws. We must change them. And I'm not saying put people in jail. I am not saying that. We need to motivate people into treatment. But the circumstances now is causing, it, it's, they're murderous. Let's, let's be clear. They're causing death. And we have to change that. We must change. We have to really open up Lantern and Petra short and take a look at that. We have to look at conservatorships. We have to look at gravely disabled. We have to create directives to physicians. You ever thought about this? When somebody has a major psychiatric illness, a diagnosis, once they stabilize and are in their right mind again, the psychiatrist needs to sit down with that patient and go, just like when Dr. Pinsky signs uh, an 80-year-old patient's uh, a post form or gives them an advanced directive on what to do when his or her brain isn't working, we're going to have the same thing for your psychiatric illness, a directive to me what to do if if and when, which is common, these are chronic illnesses and they're marked by relapses. When you have a relapse, you're giving me direction what I can legally do to get you back. Directive to physician. We need that. We need to really revisit in California, Prop 47, Prop 57, AB 109, figure out something else that, that doesn't just cause people to die and, and maybe doesn't make it look quite so glorious here for people that are in active using.
Uh, there, there's a lot to be done. Expand conservatorship, empower families. There's just so much to be done on the legislative side. I've been up to Sacramento a number of times. They've been, I've been told to take a hike, that they have no interest in doing any of this. And that is heartbreaking. Yeah, c- conservatorship is an issue that I've actually shifted on. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm an ACLU pay, dues paying member. I'm a big individual rights advocate. But, you know, at a certain point, how is it humane to let somebody who has no sense, no connection to reality, continue to do their the things and not not intervene. So that is an area where I have have changed. The more I see, yeah, you'll you if you really understand. See, people don't understand Ill, addiction, substance use disorders, or serious mental illness. They've not seen it. They don't understand it. And you know, like me, I spent thirty five years working in a psychiatric hospital. I mean, I, I get, I know what it is. And I know what they need. And I know how grateful they are when you make them better. And I know how angry they are when you let them languish in their illness. They can't believe it. Like, you left me like that. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with us is what I keep asking. But I, I, I try not to have these conversations with myself because I get too upset. But here we are this morning having it. So. Well, Dr. Dr. Drew Pinsky, I so appreciate your joining me today. Uh, you really t- say it as it is, and I appreciate it. And that's what's going to make the change come about. And that's the reason why I'm optimistic, because we have people who aren't afraid to speak their mind and, and care about these issues. Um, but, but, you did- but to be fair, my speaking my mind doesn't really change anything. What you guys are doing makes the change. And, and I applaud you guys in uh, getting out there and get, getting on the street. Because... Uh, right. It, it, no, no one needs us more <laughs> than this population. And, and the fact that they're there with, I mean, and the great, you know, with this important uh, economic powerhouse that is uh, the United States of America, that we allow people to die on our streets in open air asylums is just beyond. And it's, and it's, it, it's not income in disparity. I mean, it, of course, it has a role here. We got to treat the illness and, and learn your history about how we got here. It, it's, it was really, a group of psychiatrists from the early 40s that made it their um, their calling to become social engineers and to dismantle any state mental health systems. And they were uh, wrong minded. They'd never seen two of the three had never seen serious mental illness, which is hard to believe. But psychoanalysis had a grip on uh, American psychiatry for about 50 years. They had never seen serious mental illness. They believed the Foucaultian nonsense that uh, institutions and doctors created serious mental illness, and it was going to be their call to undo all of that. Good job. All those patients went to the streets, the prisons, the nursing homes, and the graves. Well done. You know, it's another area where I've evolved on. Uh, you know, no one likes to see a locked psychiatric unit, but the alternative is even worse. And the idea is that people don't stay permanently. They treat the illness and get them out of that. Uh, and, and, really, and, and there, yeah, there, there are ways. This is not the, the idea that people are under the influence of a book and movie that was, I'm talking about Ken Kesey and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, that was about a institution that at that point was 20 years old. We're talking about something that is approaching 100 years old and certainly at minimum 60 years ago. And, and, and looking at current mental health care as though it's similar to what we did 60 years ago. It's nothing like that. It is not anything like that. We should be able to create environments that are appealing and lovely and the locked piece should be very rare we should very rarely lock patients in in, and we should never use restraints that is modern psychiatric care and the fact that people are still under the influence of a, a a fiction that they believe we're watching a documentary from we're coming in on 70 years ago Think about that for a second. Come on now. It was the rest of medicine the same 70 years ago? It, we, it was not good in psychiatry. Psychiatry had some, had some, a lot of excesses. I saw a lot of it. I worked in a facility that was almost like a museum of psychiatry. And I was not happy with what I was seeing. But it's not the same anymore at all, at all. Yeah, well, I was going to say that is said from the perspective of someone who has lived through some big transitions in the field over the last 35 years. And, um, you know, modern psych facilities are not one flew over the cuckoo's nest, as, as you no. said. No, no. 
Well, I really wanted to thank you, Dr. Drew, for for joining and sharing your perspective today. Uh, if you enjoyed what you heard today, please do search and subscribe to the Healthy Skeptic MD wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Look for us on YouTube. Share it with friends, family, and others who might be interested, and leave us a review if you have a chance. We'll pick it up again two week in two weeks. And thanks again, Dr. Drew. My pleasure, and just congratulations on the organization and the work you guys are doing. It. it it, it calms me. <laughs> it makes me feel like we're moving. There's some movement in the right direction. Well, thanks so much for saying that. You bet. <laughs>